Mini episode 1769 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1769. This is FDH Manager Partner Rick Morris coming at you with one of our favorite FDH Lounge dignitaries, FDH Hoops Analyst Ben Chu. And it's that time of year. We're doing our 2024-2025 NBA season preview with Ben here today on the show. Going through, taking a look at uh, where we see things going and uh, an offseason that was interesting. Probably not what we would call earth-shaking in a lot of ways, but uh, interesting developments, some faces in different places, some of them materializing a little later in the off-season than others. But uh, we bring in Ben Chu, and uh, Ben, it's going to be a very interesting 2024-2025 season, the lame duck season on this current TV contract. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting just to see, because we always talk about this, Rick, in prior years, like the NBA and the NFL is also apparently in the same scenario of that. We're in that little weird transitional timeline where we're seeing a lot of the older stars phase out and the newer stars come up. So it, this is one of those timelines where it feels like a couple of teams can go on a run, but as we've seen in recent memory, parity among the championship winners has been the most apparent. Yes, it has. And uh, again, this is the most parity that we've seen as far as a turnover of champions and also just number of teams in the finals in a number of years, the most that we've seen since the mid to late 70s. And part of that has to do with, like you said, the aging out of some of the top stars of the 21st century. And some of it is, again, we we had talked about this uh, on the show previously in the last couple of years in Pro Hoops Draftology and Fantasy Hoops Draftology on the uh, website at fantasydrafthelp.com. By the way, the 2024 version coming very, very shortly with the fantasy and non-fantasy preview for this season. But talking about this, and this was basically back at sort of like the tail end of the pandemic, that we were in a little bit of a, a hangover period of the previous era there. You still had Golden State being somewhat relevant. They won the title in 2022. You, you still had uh, LeBron and the Lakers in 2020. You had a period of time there, even Chris Paul making the finals with Phoenix in 2021. But you had these other teams on the way up, like Denver, that would end up winning the title in 2023. Boston is a hangover team from the previous era because they just couldn't get past LeBron in the Eastern Conference, subsequently making it to the finals in 2022, winning it all in 2024. But you're at a period of time where this sort of crossing of the previous era and this new era, like you said, like you kind of indicated there, it's about done because you're, you're seeing the teams that are emerging in this era. We saw it last year, the strong emergence of teams like Oklahoma City and Minnesota, and uh, you're, you're getting that kind of turnover at the top here uh, to where in another two or three years, I think it's just going to be those teams, and you're not going to see much of a hangover from the previous era at all. Maybe Boston, if they can keep their uh, team together, but they're already facing second apron uh, issues. Right, and I think the big question right now, too, is is that with the new CBA and the second apron and how these teams are going to be constructed and how just the game currently is viewed, there is a very interesting scenario of how a lot of these younger franchises are going to start to build. And we're not even, we're still a ways away, but we're also then talking about the Cooper flag draft next year. So it's going to be, it's a very interesting year. So we're, and again, I, to make the analogy, Rick, it feels almost like in both conferences, a little bit, it's a little bit more defined in the East and the West, but it feels more like there's a lot of competitive teams and a lot of championship contenders, but there isn't anyone that's like definingly out in front. Like it's clear Boston is the best team right now in the NBA. 
But I would make the argument that there are enough teams that you could say, well, if you put them in a seven-game series with Boston, they can beat them. Yeah, I think that's very possible, depending on what the matchups are. And uh, again, Boston, as we saw last year, all the way up to the finals against Dallas, uh, was catching other teams when they weren't really at full strength. So uh, that is it's definitely something that has been established, that uh, if teams face them at full strength, uh, it has a chance to be, uh, based on their talent level and their matchups, uh, a very viable opportunity there. In looking at the Atlantic Division where Boston is, uh, again, a lot of uh, noise recently here. Uh, you just had the Knicks with the Nova Four getting put together, uh, but they get broken up before they can play a regular season game together as the Knicks make the move to trade uh, DiVincenzo and Randall for Carl Anthony Towns. And uh, in one sense, apparently strengthening that starting lineup, uh, again, breaking up a little bit of the uh, uh, chemistry that they were going for, sort of chemistry uber alles, the way that they ended up, uh, I would say, overpaying for Johnson in the name of like, oh, well, hey, this is a guy that he won championships at Villanova with, the chemistry on his team doubling down on that aspect of it, and you still have three guys there. Uh, and Brunson uh, as the key out of them uh, and one of the best players in the league. But uh, a very interesting thing. They're going to have to uh, get accustomed to uh, Towns' game and uh, vice versa. Philly kind of hanging on the periphery of the top of the division here, uh, going for it strongly with getting Paul George. It's a three-team race in the division, uh, but I see it being in that order. Boston, New York, Philadelphia, but uh, it is a race that could go down to uh, the last week or two of the season. Right, and I and it's pretty clear that the Atlantic comp, the excuse me, the Atlantic division is probably going to be won by Boston. But again, I mean, if the Knicks and Cat can assimilate into that offense and work well with Tom Thibodeau, they have a very good opportunity. Bench depth is going to be brought up as a question, but I mean, if you look, they they've had guys in their pipeline like Miles McBride and Mitchell Robinson will probably be back to a healthier form, so they. Have a pretty deep team, Philly. Again, we really don't know how that's going to look overall. Obviously, having Paul George is a little bit better than having Tobias Harris, but Philly just seems like one of these teams that if it all clicks, they can really work well together. But then again, it comes down to the question of can Paul George, you know, do well in the playoffs? Will it be stay healthy? And the question I think for Philly fans, I think this is one of the bigger underlying things we need to consider is that Tyrese Maxey has the opportunity to take that next step again. He's already done that, but I feel like he can up his game to an even higher level. He can, and they're going to need that because uh, out of their big three, he is uh, by far the youngest player and uh, somebody that uh, they may be relying upon if uh, Embiid and or George end up uh, missing any period of time here. I will say uh, there should be less time missed by everybody. This is one of the things that occurred in the offseason here when they set the schedule, that uh, back-to-back regular season games cut by 23%. So uh, no more four games and five nights, eight games and 12 nights, and you don't have uh, games on the eve of or after what are considered to be high-profile, nationally televised games. So uh, it will be interesting to see how teams like Philadelphia handle that when they have a little bit of an excuse to do the old uh, load management deal. But, uh, yeah. All right. It's going to be interesting to see how that will work. And then for the rest of the division, like the Raptors and the Nets, I think we both are going to assume aren't going to be great, but they are both very intriguing rosters right now, so... They are. I don't think any of them make any big noise, but it would not shock me if either one of them fell into the playoff race. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see Brooklyn making it as a play-in team by default, because you look at the bottom end of the Eastern Conference, and you're going to have to make a case for somebody down here out of the uh, the bottom five or six teams. So I could, I could see it still being Brooklyn, notwithstanding them wanting to go into tank mode for Cooper Flagg. Uh, they may have to trade off a few more pieces in order to uh, lose enough games. But uh, you look at the Central Division, and this is uh, a situation where the only real uh, change for the Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, although it's a big one, uh, J.B. Bickerstaff uh, getting dismissed and replaced by Kenny Atkinson, and seeing what will happen there with the change in direction 
Uh, there, there are some different things that he wants to do offensively, the new coach, uh, which uh, this team could certainly benefit from. Uh, the roster construction of it with the two smaller guards and, and the two guys who arguably should be playing center uh, in, in there, it, it's still a little bit of a wonky kind of an issue, but what I respect about Atkinson is that he has uh, he was asked at his opening press conference about uh, Evan Mobley and developing him, and he didn't shy away from it. And he said uh, that's on, he basically said that's on me if he doesn't become a top five player in this league. So you do like to see a coach embracing the pressure rather than shying away from it. I think under the circumstances that in looking at this, looking at the difficulties that Milwaukee had once Doc Rivers came on last year, the difficulties they had all year, but difficulties that really didn't turn around at that point, I've got Cleveland narrowly over Milwaukee in the division, and then again narrowly over Indiana in the three spot there. Uh, I, I think Indiana is definitely uh, up and coming, as we saw with that run they went on in the playoffs last year. I've got Chicago and, of course, Detroit well back of those three. Yeah, and I think it pretty much that's how it's going to mainly shake out at this point, at least Central. I feel like it's the one conference in the East that seems pretty set, almost, in terms of that. But it also feels like, too, Rick, that the Cavs, the Bucks, and the Pacers all have one thing in common. They all have some issue or fatal flaw currently on their roster. For Cleveland, a lot of their top talent plays very similar positions, so it's going to be interesting to see how Kenny Atkinson starts to stagger and do what they can in Milwaukee. It's Lillard and Giannis trying to get on the same page and, you know, get back to full health there. And we'll, we'll see, because the question, I think everyone assumed that Dame and Giannis would fit really well together, but there were plenty of times last season where it just kind of felt like it, they didn't mesh right or it didn't work. So they'll have a full season under, they'll, they'll have another full season under their belt. So it's going to be interesting in Indiana. We'll see. They are, I like to say, a very good team, but they also are a very prime progression candidate for in the Eastern Conference because, again, they have the pace and they can control the game just as well as anyone. But we've also seen teams like this make that ascension after one year, get to a conference finals, but then ultimately disappear the following season. Yeah, I could see that happening more so in terms of the playoffs. I, I've got them getting back to the playoffs, albeit I think they could still be a play-in team just because like, the top of the conference is sort of the opposite of the bottom of the conference. I can make a case for Brooklyn being in there because the bottom of the conference is so awesome. The top of the conference is thick enough that I could see a team like Indiana having a good season, not making the top six, but still making it into the playoffs through the uh, the play-in. And uh, that's a thing where, yeah, they are potentially a, a regression candidate, as you mentioned. That will be worth keeping an eye on. Uh, one of the least interesting divisions in basketball, the Southeast. Uh, I have uh, Orlando ascending to uh, take the division here, and uh, Miami making it again as a play-in team, I think largely for the same reason as Indiana, that, uh, again, it's going to be tough to nail down one of the top six spots in the uh, the East. Charlotte, Atlanta, Washington, well, well, well behind those three. I think it's an opportunity for Orlando to step up. They are a very, very dangerous young team. They still have some holes on that team, but uh, getting a player that likes a KCP to be able to come over there uh, has certainly helped in that regard, and uh, they're hoping, as are the Cavs also. The Cavs in Orlando, who had that first round series a year ago, they, the one thing that they have in common coming into this season is they are betting a lot of chips on growing from within. For the Cavs, it's with a different coach. Orlando, it's with the status quo. Basically, as the Cavs were a year previous with J.B. Bickerstaff. Orlando hoping to grow from within, and I think probably having a pretty good chance of doing that. Right, and we're going to have to we're gonna see how that roster, because it is probably, I would say, in all of the NBA, one of the most interesting rosters in Orlando. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be interesting to see how a lot of their younger guys, like Anthony Black, Jet Howard, are going to take, and, you know, Mo, Mo Vagna had a very interesting playoffs in that first round series with Cleveland. And it's going to be interesting because Orlando, we, we've seen this with them as just a franchise. If we chart the growth of the Orlando Magic franchise, there's a period of timeline like where they're up for a bit, they're down for a bit, up for a bit, down for a bit, and they're back up again. 
And it's going to be really interesting to see. I think the question is, and it's going to come down to this, is can they get enough guard play to get them? Because if you just look at the raw talent of Apollo Brancaro, he has an opportunity to get himself into potential MVP conversations down the line if he can help lead that young franchise to, you know, get them to an Eastern Conference Finals. And, you know, the one thing that you do have to respect about the rest of that Southeastern division that there is still a lot of raw talent. The problem is is that it's a lot of hodgepodge talent on a bunch of different teams. It is. And you have teams like Charlotte and Atlanta and Washington that are still very, very early in the stages of their you know, quote unquote, rebuilding. And uh, so that's what makes it a little bit softer for Orlando and Miami with the schedules that they face. And and yet I don't have uh, either of those teams with uh, records on par with the champions of the Atlantic and the Central uh, divisions here. Uh, in the Western Conference, uh, again, uh, almost all of these divisions, uh, super, super interesting. The, uh, the Southwest, uh, I, I like Dallas sort of by default. At this point in time, I, I think that, uh, again, they are probably not a, a real regression candidate, I would say. They add Clay Thompson in the offseason. Again, for what he's worth, for what he can deliver at this point in time, and you do have to kind of say it that way, uh, but uh, he will give them a little bit more oomph in terms of the scoring power uh, than they had last year. I, I think Houston could be not necessarily on their heels, but uh, I, I do like Houston to make a jump up and to grab one of the six locked in playoff spots here. Uh, I've, I've got New Orleans in the play in uh, Memphis. I, I have out of it all together just because uh, again, I, I think that there's going to be one or two teams that are pretty good in the Western conference that don't make even the play in. Uh, and I've got Memphis as one of those teams. It's hard to know what to make of them uh, just because you haven't seen all the pieces together consistently enough over the last year or so. San Antonio, I've got well back of, of that point, but uh, possibly able to make a jump in another year or so. But uh, this, this division is very intriguing, and it does seem like one of those you know magic eight balls where like if you shook it up a little bit, I, I think Dallas still ends up on top, but what the two, three, four looks like behind them could, could really kind of vary based on what the circumstances are this year. And I would also make this argument too, Rick. It would not surprise me if it's a complete inverse of that order as well. Okay. It would not shock me because it's probably going to be one of the most competitive divisions in the NBA. And it feels like to me that despite Dallas having all this talent and having all these things, we have to re we remember this was also a team removed only from not making the playoffs at all. Yes. And we're going to have to look into the, ultimately the health of Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving and the rest of that team. Again, I love Clay Thompson, but the question is, is he going to stay healthy? And the interesting part I have to say with the rest of the division, that Houston and New Orleans are both very talented teams. But both also have that weird mix of young veterans in all places. I'm the most intrigued player, uh, most intriguing player I want to see in that division might be DeJounta Murray with the Pelicans, just because... They haven't really had a dynamic guard to pair with Zion. You know, I kind of feel like you need that just so that you can space the floor a little bit better with him. And again, my thing too is Memphis, in my opinion, out of all the teams in the NBA, are the biggest boom bust prospect of anything. They could be a team that easily gets into the playoffs, or they could be a team on the outside looking in. And San Antonio, let's be honest. We know it's Wemby and friends, but I do think there is a scenario that with having sort of the leadership of a Chris Paul and some of those other pieces that are on that roster having another year to play with Wemby, they could, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs, but it would not shock me if they're in that contention to get in at some point in the season. They could be. And one of the things with Dallas that I, I, I want to point out is you were talking about it with Clay, and I'm going to throw Kyrie in the mix here too. There's a situation where people have pointed this out previously with Indiana, that what they did, and, and again, you can't say it didn't work because they, they made that run to the Eastern Conference Finals, but bringing in Pascal Siakam as the big star to pair uh, with uh, Tyrese Halliburton, you're looking at a circumstance where your best players are on different timetables vis-a-vis -vis their career. 
uh, or you know where where it is on the timeline to to steal a, uh, a favorite uh, Ben Chu saying. So with Dallas, it's kind of the same thing because Luca is still a pretty young guy, and his second and third best players are substantially older. And uh, look, I mean, part of it is with Golden State they they had the, the they were facing the issues with the second apron and whatever. But honestly, if they st- if they thought that Clay Thompson could still help them substantially, they would have found a way to make that happen. He was available because Golden State let him be available. So it's one of those things where they did what they needed to do as far as putting the best possible pieces around Luka, but let's not pretend that it's an organized plan the way that other teams are doing it, where their superstars are all on basically the same timetable. Correct, and I feel like also it's very similar to the Houston scenario too. It's like they have a lot of guys like Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks, but a lot of these other younger guys like Jalen Green and Jabari Smith and now Reed Shepard coming into the mix. It's going to be very interesting how that works and gels together. It is going to be. And uh, I will say, again, I had a little bit of an outlier opinion with the draft this year, uh, the way that uh, a lot of folks were uh, looking at it and favoring some of the international prospects at the top of the draft here. On the FDH draft board, I had Reed Shepard number one overall, and you could say, well, Rick, that goes to you being a Mark Price mark and how much he reminds you of, of him, but uh, based on you know what we've seen of him thus far in the very limited sample size since being in a, a Houston uniform, and again, none of these games counting in the regular season or anything, but uh, again, he is showing that he can be somebody who can be a, a real difference maker in that backcourt because, uh, again, in today's day and age, one of the most important elements, if not the most important element, is the ability to score from any place on the floor, and that's what that guy can do, as well as being a good distributor. Right, and again, the question's going to be, and I think this will be one of Ime Yudoka's big question is, how do you balance this roster together? Because there were many instances last year, Rick, where they... They started off a little wonky, but then they came on strong at the end of the season. But then you're going to have the question I have, which is, is how do you mix Dylan Brooks and a Fred Van Vliet with a Jalen Green, Jabari Smith Jr., Shangoon, Reed Shepard sort of cornucopia at the end of the day? So my, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And I mean, just to also, if you kind of look on the flip side for like a team like New Orleans, it's like they still are very talent laden, but they still, it, again, I, I feel like the right words to describe a lot of teams in the Western Conference is hodgepodgey. I mean, they have a lot of talent and a lot of good players on their roster, but it's just we don't know how they're going to fit at this current time. That's true. And that's a situation where, again, and with, with New Orleans, Part of the issue with them, I mean, actually, maybe most of the issue with them, is the duality that they live with of the availability of Zion. Is everything going to hold up with him? Is he going to be in there? Is he going to be good to go? Is he going to give them, you know, a minimum of 70 games and be good for the playoffs? And uh, they look like, obviously, a different team when he's there, when he's not there. And it's to their credit that they've been as successful as they've been when he's not there, that they've been able to fashion an alternative style of uh, of executing in his absence. But that's the kind of thing that can, can wear on a team. You mentioned Sengun with Houston. I think he's already one of those guys where when they get to where they're going and they appear to be on their way, he's capable of being a top three te- a player on a championship team, clearly. So, you know, you have one of your guys to build around. You arguably may have, out of that mix of guys you were talking about, maybe a, a second one of a big three Quote unquote. And that's one of those things where, again, and I know Udoka being the coach and not the GM, he's not going to have necessarily final say on this. But I mean, I would say at a certain point in time here, it may be time to take off the training wheels and basically sort of figure, okay, Brooks and uh, Van Vliet, they've done what you wanted them to do, which is to sort of elevate you know, some of this talent here, teach these guys how to win a little bit. Like, is that a scenario where you could see, even if they're a contender, where you could see those guys being available at the trading deadline because they decide they just want to unleash the young horses and go with it, uh, you know, for better or for worse? I would not rule that out as a possibility. I think that's a very good point. And 
it, it's this tough scenario when you're trying to build a championship team in professional sports. And I feel like the NBA is probably the easier of the leagues more than anything because you only have to field a team of 15 guys. Yeah. But the question then becomes is what is – you want the right veterans to lead your young players. And I feel like Van Vliet and Brooks are those sort of guys. But then the question is, is there oh, – there is Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks the right fit for a team that trajectory-wise – is in range to make the playoffs. But if you're looking further down the line, you're looking more at a core of Shepard, Jabari Smith Jr., Jalen Green, and Shingoon. So at this point, it would be wise to consider other options for those, for guys like Van Bleed or Brooks. And I don't know what Houston's really going to think, but at least for now, I feel like I think they're accepting of the duality of it all at this point. And, you know, we'll see. It's either going to come very swiftly or it's, going to be the same for a little bit in that with that franchise. Well, that's it. Yeah, I remember it was a real eyebrow raiser to me uh, when they brought in Van Vliet and Brooks in the first place uh, because of the way that that team was, was going. But then, obviously, with Udoka coming in and, and he wanted the, the capacity to be able to uh, win some games sooner rather than later, and uh, it, they, they weren't really at the point where they needed to tank anymore because they already had a couple of young guys you could build around. So you could kind of squint and see where it made sense a year ago, and, and, and it looked like it did sort of make sense on the court for as much as they were going to be able to do in one season, and it didn't hold back the growth of a player like Sengun to be able to get to where he's at right now. But yeah, I mean, going forward, sort of the same thing about the timeline to a lesser extent of what we said with Indiana and Dallas. Because in those cases, you're talking about players that are central to the ability to win right now. Versus in Houston, that's not really the case. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, a young Van Vliet who was, you know, one of the core players on a championship team in Toronto, that'd be one thing. But with what Van Vliet and Brooks project to give you going forward, it's not even on the level of importance of what a Clay Thompson is in Dallas. Because he's trying to help them convert in a championship window. So in that sense, it does kind of make more sense for them to move on from them if they feel like they have the ability to do so and, and kind of rise or fall with the young guys uh, in the uh, latter part of this season. Looking at the Northwest Division, uh, I know there's a lot of East Coast basketball honks that will tell you that the 1-2-3 in the Atlantic Division is the best in basketball. Don't you listen to them? It is all about the Northwest Division here. Oklahoma City, Minnesota, Denver. I have it being sort of a hair's breadth in that order between those three teams. But that's a 1-2-3 punch the likes of which you don't see anywhere else in basketball. Don't give me Celtics, Knicks, 76ers. These three teams here, and, and again, the champions of the uh, 2023 season, the Denver Nuggets, actually being the team I have in third of those three teams here. You have a Utah team that is still kind of trying to figure out what their identity is going forward, where they're at in the rebuilding phase. Portland, which is a real bottoming out candidate, could be a candidate for a strong candidate for Cooper Flag a year from now. But the one, two, three at the top of the division here, and you look at uh, Oklahoma City strengthening themselves in the pivot with Hartenstein there in a way that really kind of plugs a, a gap that they had a year ago here and, and, and really makes them potentially the best all around team in the Western Conference. Uh, Minnesota, again, they're losing Carl Anthony Towns. I think they take a, a step backward in terms of their floor spacing and, and, and where that goes, and might there be a little bit of a downstream effect on Anthony Edwards with that in terms of Julius Randle not uh, spreading the floor quite as much, albeit you are going to have DiVincenzo coming in, albeit that will be in a bench role. And then Denver, uh, again, they have gotten picked apart by the, uh, the cap and uh, the fear of the second apron quicker than I thought they were going to. I mean, a year or two ago, I was talking dynasty with this team, but they've already had a, let a number of parts go. You kind of raised your eyebrows in the offseason when they uh, re-signed Jamal Murray for, for what they did. And I basically said to you, look, they're pot committed. This is what they have to do at this point, and uh, they have to commit uh, to that. And, you know, you, you've still got uh, Gordon and you've, you've still got uh, Porter in there as uh, supporting options uh, to the big guy, uh, Jokic, the best player in the league. But uh, the, the, the gap between your top players and the bench 
is, is certainly so much more than what it was when they won the championship two years ago. So that one, two, three right there, uh, it's one of the strongest one, two, threes, I think, in a division in all of sports and probably uh, in the NBA in recent history. Yeah, it's been a while since you've had pure depth in a division like that. Just yeah. in, like you might have to even go back records like the early 2000s or the, or the 90s to have those three teams there. And it's, it's, it's very interesting, too, but very similar to what we talked about with the, you know, with kind of the central division, too. It's like it's clear there's like the top three, but they all kind of still have their own flaws again, too. Denver... We, I'll lead off with them. They clearly still have the best player in the world, and they still have a lot of great complimentary pieces. But if you look at their bench, it's very thin. The Russell Westbrook of it all is going <laughs> to be an interesting sort of mixture there. I'm not sure if that's the right fit, but I could definitely see Russ on that second unit speed the tempo of get some good-looking shots for some of the younger guys like Julian Strother and you know Christian Braun. So it's... Denver is one of those weird teams where I don't know what to make of them right now. It's like they have all the pieces to be a championship contender, but I don't know exactly, you know, if that was more like we were surmising that they were going to become this dynastic team and they end up just taking one championship. But if you look at, you know, the other two names in the room, Minnesota is going to be interesting, you know. Obviously, Towns is going to be, no Towns is going to definitely impact Anthony Edwards on some level, but Randall, especially during the tail end of his time at the Knicks, was at least doing his best to spread the floor and take jumpers from outside like 20, 22 feet. So it's going to be interesting. And I think we're going to probably see a shift of, you know, maybe we'll see more Minaj Reed and then different pairings with Gobert and Randall. So it's going to be, I, I like this team a little bit less, but I do feel like their depth especially on the perimeter defensively, definitely improved with getting deep in Chenzo as well. And OKC right now is being very well run and getting Hardenstein and getting Alex Caruso in the offseason is super big for them. But again, it rolls back to the same question I had with them last year's. Who is the number two guy next to Shea Gilgis Alexander? And I don't think they have that number two guy at this current time. Really? Because I would say Holmgren without really batting an eyebrow, and uh, I, I would say also, too... Uh, uh, I, I don't think he's there yet, Rick. You don't think so? He, okay. Last season, I don't think he... In my opinion, if Chet Holmgren was there, Rick, I think they would have won that series against Dallas. Okay. Is, is it fair to and say... Again, maybe I need to prep this more. It's like, I mean in terms of a number two scoring option. I think that's probably what I should have said, because I think they have talent with home grant and Jalen Williams, but I don't think either of them are consistent enough as to be able to be that number two guy. Home grant, I agree, is is going to be more likely to get there first, but I still need to kind of see that because last year, as you saw in the playoffs, it was a very heavy Shea Gilders Alexander team. It was. It definitely was. And, and I, again, the big question, uh, again, as we, we have discussed, I, I'm a little harder on OKC than most teams, but what I will say, and we looked at the history of the franchise at that time. Sam Presti's done a great job of refilling the war chest and having all these picks and getting all these guys. I'm still waiting for them to make that one move to help push them over the top. They're still doing a lot of of improving around the edges. And the question I still have to ask is this is the same thing they did during the the uh, the triplet era of Westbrook Harden and Durant. How about a different scenario there? I still want to see Presti not necessarily have to go all in, but I have to at least see them push forward for a guy that could be that difference maker, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, as much as I love Alex Caruso and Isaiah Hart and St. Rick Morris, I don't think they're that dramatic of a difference maker at the end of the day. Yeah, and that's the thing where, again, they're, they're adding the pieces in and roles that they know have been lacking. But, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's not a dramatic one in that way. Based on what you just said there, would you say that Chet Holmgren is, is, is maybe the most important X factor in the NBA this year? Because if he proves you wrong, then they are a team that uh, should be probably at least a co-favorite to win the championship. Uh, if, if you're right about him, that's going to hold them back and maybe keep them from going further than they were. 
a year ago here. Uh, does, does he hold that level of importance in terms of the NBA fabric this year when you're looking at uh, what he can deliver for them? I would not go as that far, but I do feel like it's within that range, though, Rick. Okay. Because I do feel like, because the question is, is that, and, and we saw this exactly in the Dallas series, which is, if you look back and watch most of those games that OKC lost, it was pretty much Shea. Shea mm-hmm. pretty much did everything on the floor. And if you look at the box scores, he was their leading scorer in those games. Yeah. And it just felt like nearing the end of games, it kind of turned in, we discussed this in the moment, it turned into a lot of ISO LeBron at the end of the game. Right. And the question is, is that if OKC wants to get to that championship level or get to a finals, that offense does not work. Like no. They are going to really need someone else to step up. And it could be someone else we haven't even talked about. I know they're growing a lot of different players. We might see more Osby and Dang this year, too. Yeah. But it just strikes me that OKC, in my opinion, is clearly the favorite to win the West. Mm-hmm. But my concern with them is, is that they haven't really done anything, in my opinion, at this point to prove that they want to they want to um, push themselves to the top of the Western Conference, give them space very similar to what Boston did last year in the East. Yes, uh, they have not uh, made that dramatic move Yeah, just adding the pieces around the margins to try to shore up the areas where they needed some help here. But, uh, yes, uh, and it will be interesting to see if that's on the table for them uh, if they don't get off to as good of a start. And they definitely have the options, and they definitely have the picks coming up, too. So They do. They, they do. might not need to go get someone, but, again, they're going to have to. So one of these, the question I've always had is that everyone says, especially about Sam Presti. He is a great GM, and he does great drafts, but you also have to look down the line that he's also whipped on some picks pretty badly as well. Well, and I, I feel vindicated in terms of what I've said to you all along, that this whole thing like, oh, Oklahoma City with the war chest, look at all these picks they got from other teams. I have said to you consistently, and you've agreed with me, that the foundational players they are going to get are going to be from them sucking and them bottoming out. Because when you're trading for picks from other teams, uh, particularly in, in many instances, right, you're trading off your guys to a contender. Well, what makes you think that the contender is going to be bad enough at that period of time where it's like, oh, we ended up with the first pick or the second pick or the third pick? I mean, if you're lucky, you're getting guys that can be depth-type players. And that's how, that's how Oklahoma City has built their roster a lot in that way. They have pretty good depth with their young players, and that's what they're using a lot of these picks for. But any team that goes into a rebuilding mode, first and foremost, they're going to get their foundational players in the draft if they find them there by dint of their own suckage, for the most part, rather than what they get from other teams. So part of this thing of the war chest that they have is a little bit overrated. Of Like, oh my gosh, they have 63 first-round picks through 2028. Okay, but how many of them are going to be high picks? So yeah, now right, and it, and also to the note, Rick, the of those picks remaining, the ones that are probably going to be the most notable are those Clippers picks coming up. Yep. So though it's going to depend to see how the Clippers do. Like there are scenarios where we've seen, at least based on the odds, if you look at you know we look at Vegas at the end of the day, the Clippers are anywhere from being a play-in team to being one of the worst teams in the Western Conference. So I've I it, got them. It's, that's the question, and I do think, you know, and again, I know I'm also being hard on OKC, but we've seen the, I hate to say it, we've seen this story before about when OKC will make the extension. The first time around, it was due to cheapness of ownership. This time around, I'm more concerned that Presti's not going to make a move to get them there. Well, yeah, and that uh, that's going to be something he's going to need to do if it turns out that they don't have enough there, and if, if it turns out that... They, and, and again, it's kind of funny, because we don't think of them in this way. We don't think of Oklahoma City in the same way that we do. I mentioned it earlier with Cleveland and with Orlando. But that basically the theory of the case with both of those teams is that you're going to be seeing improvement from within with the young players. There are, there are a lot of smart marks in, in Cleveland, particularly on Cavs' Reddit. They were like... What did they do this offseason? What did they do? I'm like, they changed coaches, but the theory of the case with the Cavs for years has been improvement from within and the growth of the young players. You see it now with Orlando also, albeit they added KCP there. We don't think of Oklahoma City as being in the same kind of category because they're further along than those other two teams. But again, like you said, they made the moves around the margins 
that I think could be somewhat kind of significant. But basically, the theory of the case for Oklahoma City is going to be that the big three that they see that they have, they take that step forward and they become a championship team. And if that doesn't happen, then like you said, it becomes a matter of adjusting and going and getting an additional piece. I certainly don't think they'll need two, but the worst case for the scenario for them is I think they might need one. Yeah, and we, we've discussed this very in the past. Like, And again, my issue with them right now is I don't think they have a consistent number two scoring option at this time. Now, I'm not saying that their roster can't get there. But what I'm saying is that just from what we saw last year in the playoffs, Shea looked like he needed help at the end of some of those games. Yes, and uh, that's where, again, they're going to need to have a different look. They're going to need to have a radically different look in the playoffs this year. They think they'll have it. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, you mentioned the Clippers. Uh, I have the middle of the pack in the Pacific Division, but this is a uh, – when, when we talked before about the previous era of the NBA aging out, I mean, if there was a division that summed this up, it would be the Pacific Division. Um, I have Sacramento winning more or less by default because of the state of the other franchises in the division at this point. I've got Phoenix, the Clippers, and Golden State as play-ins. I actually have the Lakers narrowly missing even the play-ins at this point. The Clippers, of course, in their first year at Intuit Dome, and uh, Steve Ballmer needs them to be a strong team to be able to get this new era of the Clippers off to a good start, but it doesn't align with the timeline that they're on. They do have they have the ultimate safety net as far as Ty Lu as a head coach. You have him as a head coach, and there's going to be a limit to how bad you are, particularly when you still have Kawhi Leonard available for at least half of your games here. But uh, you look at the other teams. I actually think, and for as much publicity as, of course, Bronny James got getting drafted to the Lakers, I actually think my guy from Tennessee, Dalton Connect, going to them, never should have fallen to the Lakers in the draft. Uh, if there's any kind of a hope for them to have any kind of life breathed into them this year, it, it might be from the Rook. But this is not a team that basically turns to the Rooks for that much unless they really have to. Are they going to be desperate enough at this point in time? Phoenix, we, we, we've seen where, again, they basically topped off at, at, at where they're at with this ridiculous all-in uh, circumstance that they did, and now getting themselves capped out. That, that this, uh, w w not not comparing it to the shadiness of the Deshaun Watson situation in the NFL, but it's the closest thing to that trade we've seen in the NBA recently. Of where when they went all in with Beal and Durant, of having it blow up in their face drastically, and like with the Browns, no way out of that circumstance. I do a Phoenix in second, like I said, Clippers in third, Golden State in fourth. Uh, but again, outside of Sacramento, who I, I, I think is a decent team in the, in the conference, uh, a fringe, fringe, fringe contender in the conference. I would use the word fringe three times before I said contender for the conference. But the other teams basically just sort of clinging to relevancy, I think, at this point. Right. And, and it's, I find it so fascinating because uh, before this uh, shooting, of the, this, excuse me, this recording of this mini episode, Looking at just like how variances of how that division looks like it's going to be predicted out. Because I've seen everything from Phoenix winning to Sacramento winning to the Lakers winning to the Clippers winning. So it just kind of feels, again, like a bunch of teams that don't know where their true direction is. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, the Lakers are the Lakers. We You have the whole... LeBron and Bronny playing together, then you have Connect, and then you'll also get, they also have some good sort of top line talent and guys like, I, I feel like at least for this season that this Lakers team is much deeper than last year's team with the addition of Connect, and then we'll probably see a little bit more of Jordan Machino and, uh, you know, Jackson Hayes is also there as well. So you're going, and, you know, Gabe Vincent will probably have a more, will be more relevant this season than last. But again, it's, it's also very hard right, to completely rule out a LeBron, Anthony Davis, led Lakers team to at least not get into the playoffs. And the rest of, you know, the teams like Phoenix is interesting too. Maybe, you know, they can figure it out, take the next step. Maybe you said Nurkic can hit three to four three-pointers a game potentially. And then the Kings are, I mean, the Kings, it's, it's weird to say that there was a couple of years, a couple years back, there was a the whole discussion of Sacramento's extending to be the new 
eighth team in the West, and that lasted about a a, a cold minute. Yeah. And then they bring in DeMar DeRozan, who's very an interesting player for them, just because I think, and just in the totality of how they're building that squad now, it's like they kind of have their two guys, and now like DeRozan's the ultimate supporting castmate at this point. So I, I think they're going to be a very interesting team. It would not shock me if maybe DeRozan helps push them over the top at some point. Mm-hmm. It still kind of feels like that this was kind of more fool's gold for in Sacramento. It might very well be. I just sort of have them winning the division by default because I look at where they're at, and, and they're, they're at least basically sort of an aligned team as far as you know the the timelines of uh, the talent on the roster and and where they're they are and where they're looking to be. There's not the imbalances of it or predominantly old players uh, trying to go for one last hurrah, which is what I see with the rest of the division. And one of the things that's just fascinating to me about the Western Conference is uh, and now again I have Houston making a jump up into the playoffs, but you look at the, the following number of teams here. Uh, Now, again, I I think it won't be a shock to anybody. Portland, Utah, and San Antonio don't make even the play-ins this year. Although I agree with you, there's a scenario where San Antonio takes a run at it. But let's let's take them out of of it here. The gap between basically 6 and 12 in the Western Conference, you're going to have one of these teams making the playoffs, uh, and a couple, four teams making the play-in, two teams missing it all together. This is the pool of teams, probably. Houston, New Orleans, Memphis, uh, and then uh, the four teams from this division here, uh, Phoenix, Clippers, Golden State, Lakers. Like We're, we're looking at a world where two of these teams are going to miss the, the, even the play-in this year. And, and, and I don't think anybody is, is, is yet looking at that sort of scenario because I think maybe the whole world is expecting that, oh, well, it's going to be Houston again. They're not going to make the jump up. Or uh, it could be New Orleans if Zion misses a bunch of games. Like I think the world is looking at the landscape here and expecting not to be surprised. I think there's going to be a big surprise by the end of the year at the teams that don't make the playoffs. I have that, be, and even the play-in, I have that being the Lakers, and I have that being a, a Memphis team that a lot of people are expecting to come back. And the, the, the gap between all of these teams is very, very, very narrow. You could, you could basically put the, the names in a paper bag, shake it up, and take out the names in whatever order and have about as good of a chance as my predictions are, I would say, for how close they are. But... There's definitely going to be surprises, I think, at the end of the year. Like, oh my God, I can't believe this team didn't even make the play-in. Yeah, and, and again, this is, again, we've discussed about the imbalance of both of the conferences for over the last three years that we've done these. And it feels more like the West is not necessarily getting stronger. It's just more of the talent is starting to reside. So a lot of these teams that were probably fringe playoff teams or like down in the dumps years ago, is actually rebuilding. While the Eastern Conference, a lot of teams have either fallen off, or or in the cases of Detroit and Charlotte, just have stunk for so long that they aren't even really even sniffing the playoffs. Yeah, another thing you don't have in the Western conferences, because I'm not going to, for as much as I'm criticizing all the non-Sacramento teams in the Pacific Division. It's a thing where, with the possible exception of Phoenix, and again, they're pot committed. They couldn't get out of this thing if they if they wanted to. They they got the uh the, the they're they're basically uh, strapped in place on this one here. But a team like Chicago in the Eastern Conference, where the ownership is like, it's okay, we're just a player away, we're just a player away, and year in and year out, the best case scenario is they scrape and claw into the play in, like in in the Western Conference. I don't think there's as much delusion as there is. I mean, Washington, look at the number of years that they tried to cling with Bradley Beal. Like, we're just another player away. Like, in, in the Western Conference, again, leaving aside Phoenix, and even if they were having second you know thoughts right now, they couldn't do anything about it. Uh, I think everybody is always striving. And that's something you don't necessarily see in the East, and that definitely makes a difference. Yeah. And, I mean, the one thing, too, is, is that We've seen at least, the, like, it's, it's shifting a little bit more to more balance just overall between the conferences, but it also starting, it's also starting to feel like a lot of the talent 
is still residing in the West, mainly because Western Conference GMs are doing a better job of drafting fits for their franchises. And just, it feels almost more like the East is in this perpetual top four, top five, and then everyone else stinks. While the West has just been, you know, a brutal bloodbath year after year. So teams have to get better if they want to even sniff the playoffs. That's a very good explanation of it, actually, yes. Uh, and that basically uh, steel sharpens steel, so to speak. Uh, in uh, looking at uh, my predictions by conference, uh, I'll just cut to the uh, conference finals here. Uh, I will say uh, the one-seed Boston over the three-seed Cavs in six games in the East Conference Finals. In the West, the one-seed Oklahoma City over the three-seed Denver in six. I have Oklahoma City over Boston in six. NBA MVP SGA, NBA Finals MVP SGA, Rookie of the Year Reed Shepard, Coach of the Year Kenny Atkinson. So my thoughts, uh, tell me where you differ, if at all. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm differing just a little bit there, Rick. For, uh, let me see, uh, for the Eastern Conference, I'm, I have this one pretty zoned out. It's going to be Celtics next. I'm differing only because I think that this may be the next year. On the Western side, I'm going to stay with with your suggestion. I uh, of uh, wait, what, what was your opinion? I said, I said uh, Oklahoma City over Denver. In yeah, six. oh yeah, obviously, yeah, Oklahoma City over Denver. Thank you. And then I have OKC going there. I'm leaning the Knicks right now, just because it feels like this could be the next year. MVP, obviously, you would give it to you know, if for excuse me for the MVP of the regular season. I do. I'm going to say Jokic. Okay. Uh, Finals MVP. Let's be honest. If the next one would be Jalen Brunson, Rookie of the Year, I'm going to say I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit. I'm going to go say Zachary Richeche is probably going to win Rookie of the Year here and Coach of the Year. This one's going to be very, very, very tough. But I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I love to, you know, as of, as have we discussed, I love to go out on limbs. Okay. These days. <sighs> I'm going to go Tabor Jenkins gets it this year with Memphis. Ooh, okay. All right. Well, I'm, I, I, I'm not a big fan. Of, I don't think Memphis is going to accept, but I do kind of feel like there'll be a team that is going to, if they, there's two ways Memphis is going to go, right, in my opinion. Either be really meh or very good. And I feel like Taylor Jenkins is also beloved within NBA coaching circles. So it may be his time to get it. It may be. It very well uh, could be. And uh, that's one of those things where, uh, yeah, if it's uh, the Knicks and OKC in the finals, that would be a very interesting matchup. Uh, the, the well, we also, I'm also using the narrative of the Knicks make it. We know what's going to happen. <laughs> well, it's going to it's gonna be, uh, the media coverage will be all Isaiah Hartenstein all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> we love the NBA, but if the Knicks make the finals against OKC, I think we know where that's landing. Uh, yes, exactly. And uh, I think the ref's whistles are going to land exactly where you think they're going to land, basically, in terms of what uh, the NBA wants. So, okay, so you have the historic drought of the New York Knicks ending, dating back to 1973. So, uh, we shall see how that all uh, shakes out. It will be, uh, it will be very interesting, but uh, always a pleasure breaking down the NBC, NBA scene with you, Ben Chu. I look forward to doing it again here. Uh, we get the season going. We'll take a look at the NBA Cup and uh, much, much more. So, but uh, thanks very much, as always, my man. No problem, Rick. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, everybody, for checking out FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1769.